Okay, so today's Digital Humanities Colloquium um, is called Creating Electronic Resources for African Languages, uh, Challenges and Opportunities. And we actually have three presenters today. Um, so Elsa B. Tayars is professor in the Department of African Languages at the University of Pretoria. Uh, her language of specialization is Northern Sutu or Sepedi, and her research interests are corpus linguistics, lexicography, terminology, and human language technology. Uh, she's been teaching in the Department of African Languages for more than 40 years, so very experienced, and teaches both undergraduate and postgraduate students. She's authored or co-authored 50 articles in accredited journals and regularly reads papers at national and international conferences. She's currently co-manager of the University of Pretoria a Digitization Node of Sadilar, uh, which is a government-funded project uh, which has as its focus the creation of digital resources for African languages. She's also one of the editors of Lexicos, an accredited journal that publishes articles with a lexicographic focus, and she's an NRF-rated researcher. Um, then uh, the second pre presenter is Dani Prinslow. He's a professor emeritus in African languages, also at the University of Pretoria. He's a former chairperson of Afrilex, a former head of Department of African Languages and a chair of the School of Languages. Uh, he's well known for his groundbreaking research in corpus-based African language lexicography and is the author or co-author of more than 100 publications and an equal, member, uh, uh, equal number of conference papers on this subject. Uh, so again, another very experienced um, researcher. He's received several awards as exceptional academic performer and as his centenary leading mind from the University of Pretoria and a Penselp Award for his contribution to multilingualism. He is currently co-manager of the UP uh, Digitization Node of Sadler. And um, the third presenter, also from the University of Pretoria, uh, Michel uh, Gose is a part-time lecturer uh, also in the Department of African Languages. She's also a PhD student and her field of uh, specialization is terminology. She was the project manager of the Open Educational Resource Ter Term Bank, the OERTB, uh, which focused on the collaborative development and dissemination of terminological resources. She is currently the project manager of the UP Digitization Node of Sadler. I think based on, on, on these brief bios, we can kind of guess what this a presentation will be about. Um, so I'm very curious to hear more about the um, the digitization um, um, project that, that that you're running. Um, I'll shut up now, and the, the 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 floor is yours. I'm not sure exactly who's going to present first. And I'll share. I'll stop sharing my screen as well, so you can take over. Uh, right, good morning, uh, everybody. Um, I'm Elsa Vitaliat, and I will take the um, the first uh, few slides um, that will be discussed by me. Um, but maybe before we start, um, just a little bit of background um, on the context and the purpose of our talk. Um, as we understood the director uh, from Sadila, the purpose of this colloquium was to share in a, in a slightly less formal manner the work that is done by the uh, UP digitization mode, um, specifically with the aim of exploring possible collaboration uh, with other interested parties. Um, as you've heard, we are three presenters, so we'll uh, switch be between um, presenters. Um, our talk and, and our work, um, I think, needs to be seen within a specific South African context. Um, and while we are acutely aware of the fact that there are much more sophisticated ways of doing what we do, um, we do work within a context that is constrained on, on different levels. First of all, human capacity wise, um, we are time constrained, of course, because we all have other jobs. <laughs> We're doing this as a kind of an academic sideline. Um, um, but it is also a constraint with regard to specialized computational skills um, and sophisticated software that is available to um, carry out tasks for other languages um, is not always suitable for the African languages. So we have to make do with what we have. 
Um, but this being said, I do believe that we are making a contribution to the creation of very necessary electronic resources for the African languages. Um, because um, the need for electronic resources uh, for under-resourced African languages is of the utmost importance since these resources form the basis of different kinds of human language uh, technology, such as machine translation, uh, speech recognition, electronic dictionary, spelling and grammar checkers and optical character recognition. Um, and of course, um, also with the chat GPT coming into the picture, um, that is also somewhere if if one wants to increase the visibility of African languages also on that level, one would need uh, a sizable pool of electronic resources. Um, so all of these technologies rely on large quantities of high quality electronic data and digitization is one of the strategies that can be used to collect such data. And um, for the purpose of this presentation, um, digitization is understood as the conversion of analog text, um, audio and video data from uh, into digital form, um, as well as the provision of born digital data that is currently not available in a format that enables downstream processing. The fact that something is available electronically does not really make it accessible for further, um, for further uh, uh, processing um, within the human language technology uh, sphere. So um, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, so the aim of our uh, presentation therefore is to share information on the work done by the UP digitization node and to briefly outline the tools procedures, best practice, and standards, standards that are utilized to digitize text, audio, and audiovisual material for the African languages. And we are briefly going to refer to each of these in our presentation. And of course, um, our work is done under the auspices of SADILAR. So if we look at the um, the selection of text to be digitized, one has to start somewhere and you have to decide um, what um, the priorities for digitization are going to be. So we started off our digitization effort by utilizing uh, resources which are available in the language resource center of the Department of African Languages at UP. Um, and this, these resources are of varying, varying quality. Some of them are um, donated uh, textual material, not always in excellent um, uh, 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 format or quality. Um, and they, um, these resources uh, mainly consist of donations of textual material, but we also digitize on request. So if there is a, a private entity um, who has um, textual material available and they want it to be digitized, we can also do that, um, provided that it fits in with the deliverables that we have to deliver to um, Sadilar. Um, so after selection of texts, um, one has to decide on the hardware and the software to be utilized in the digitization process. Now, once again, um, the software and the hardware were selected based on the constraints or taking into consideration the constraints with regard to uh, capacity and available technical skills. Um, so we motivate our choice of optical character recognition software, or OCR software, um, by referring to an earlier experiment um, in which we evaluated three commercially available OCR programs using Afrikaans, Isizulu, and Chivenda uh, for um, Siberia and Chivenda for illustrative purposes. We did not, we simply did not have the time um, to attempt a full scale evaluation of all available OCR software. We know that there's a lot of OCR software available, um, many of them for free, downloadable from the internet but we rather focused on selecting one that renders high quality outputs. 
Um, so the OCR that uh, for, form part of our experiment are Abbey Fine Reader 14, OmniPage Professional 18, and CTEX tools. We are aware of, of, of packages such as, for example, Tesseract, but, and we did look into that, but we found it rather user unfriendly for our purposes. So in the experiment that I referred to, we used good quality printouts of President, uh, President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa Sona of 2020 for these four selected languages. Um, so, and here you have uh, on this table, you have the average accuracy rate of the software um, based on the percentage of scanning errors and overall accuracy rate. Now, as you can see here for Afrikaans, all three packages performed well with Abby being the top performer. Um, and the OCR errors for all three packages occurred mo mainly with um, vowels where diacritics are involved. In other words, where you have a vowel E with a circumflex or, or O with a circumflex. Um, then if we move to Sepedi, Abby once again performed best, closely followed by the CTEX tool. The CTEX tool is a, um, a, a freely downloadable tool, which obviously counts in its favor. And, and once again, most OCR errors were with regard to diacritics, um, especially the ish in Sepedi, um, where the Karen is used to distinguish between the normal S and the ish sounds. And these two sounds are also distinguish between different words. Um, so, and there were also some word division errors um, with regard to the Sepedi texts. Um, the same situation for Isizulu. Here, typical errors were omission of characters for some reason. Um, but as you can see for Chivenda, uh, CTEX tools um, clearly outperformed the other packages. Uh, its dedicated catering for diacritics was effective, although not uh, faultless. So um, overall, the results indicate that Abby would be the preferred OCR tool for languages not utilizing more than a minimum of diacritic signs, even though, the, though those languages may not be supported by the software. But for languages such as Chivenda, which makes use of four consonants with a circumflex accent below and an overdot for velar N, uh, C text tools would be the tool of choice. And we assume that it will also be the case for other languages um, which um, utilize a high number of diacritic signs. Um, so the accuracy of OCR scanning um, is affected by the quality um, of the source text. And often the texts are dirty in a sense that you have handwritten notes uh, in the text and so on. Um, and there are a number of defects that can be um, automatically uh, rectified um, by using um, uh, Abbey uh, Fine Reader's automatic image. Um, and these defects include such as distorted text line, skewed images, and noise. And these can all reduce the recognition quality of a scanned document. But Abbey Fine Reader's automatic image preprocessing editor can remove some of the defects that may occur in a scanned document. Um, so apart from hard copy based texts used for digitization, there is also the option of course, of sourcing text from the internet that is usually people's first kind of knee jerk reaction, but why do you, don't you simply harvest the textual material from the internet? Um, because as uh, Evert in 2008, uh, he refers to the web as an amazing, almost inexhaustible and very convenient source of authentic natural uh, language data. However, web pages, and he also continues, are messier than other te text so sources. And interesting linguistic regularities may easily be lost among the countless duplicates, index and directory pages, web span, open and disguised advertising, and boilerplate. Um, so, Boilerplate texts um, pose a particular challenge to um, OCR scanning and digitization. Um, web pages normally contain boilerplate texts in the form of navigational structures such as menus, 
headers, for example, logos and breadcrumbs, footers, for example, copyright notices, which are really there for a reason, as my colleague would later on point out, uh, dates, and then also advertisements. So um, it is not just a question of downloading text from the internet. These texts also have to be processed and they also have to be cleaned. Um, so the cleaning um, of web source texts need, needs to be maximally automa uh, automatized. One can do manual cleaning, but it is simply not um, effective um, in terms of time or in terms of human resources. And several solutions have been suggested. Um, but the thing is, none of the software packages has ever been evaluated for the African languages. So we're not sure exactly um, how effective the, these packages will be. Um, one such an example is NCleaner, which is um, a corpus cleaning tool referred to by a number of researchers. And it is quite a simple tool for automatic boilerplate removal uh, using character level n-gram models as uh, classifiers. Um, although the proposed solutions may be um, useful for large web sourced material, it has limited applicability, especially for the African languages, due to these languages' low visibility on the internet. Um, a web-based material usually forms a small segment of African language textual um, data. Um, and furthermore, the users of African language corpora or um, text data, such as lexicographers and terminologists and linguists, really have the necessary computational skills and knowledge to A, evaluate and B, apply these procedures to the African languages. Um, and utilizing these strategies for text cleaning requires a high level of computational knowledge and skills. And these are resources which are often in short supply when it comes to the African languages. So I now hand over to my colleague, Professor Bonnie Prinsler, um, to talk a little bit more about uh, cleaning of text-based material. Thank you, as you know, by now this lorry has three drivers. This is the time for driver number two, old has been uh, to take uh, the driving seat. Um, I want to take you through six slides dealing with text uh, text cleaning, but I just want to start off uh, with a little, little bit of history. I started uh, text compilation and text cleaning uh, almost 30 years ago. And at that stage, um, it, it was quite a primitive situation. I recall that um, there was at that stage the only scanners available, so-called desk scanners by Philip Wooten Automation. Um, they could only uh, scan or take into the system one page at a time, which means that you had to uh, scan an A4 page of the source and then feed it into um, the uh, scanner like you do with the fax machine. So that was, uh, was the rather primitive times that we started over these things. But nevertheless, um, that is how we started off with uh, having uh, text-based uh, material. Now, uh, cleaning these uh, materials uh, requires less uh, as a specific computational knowledge uh, than cleaning web-sourced material, as also we has just discussed. Um, in my view, I deliberately, deliberately also always try to um, keep things, activities or suggested activities within reach of um, ordinary uh, uh, skilled computer users. We don't always have the time to run to programmers to do things for us. So many of the suggestions that I will make here uh, will simply be within the reach of let's say someone with reasonable uh, capabilities of, of com computers. Okay, three major types of scanning errors that we occur and LCB has referred to some of them. The first one here is duplication. The typical thing um, that you get, for example, uh, if, you, if it so happens that more than one a, a, a piece of similar text gets into your, your corpus, how to detect that and how to uh, clean that. 
or the situation that you often get, um, uh, let's say if you uh, scan uh, a newspaper material, that newspaper material uh, uh, show quite a number of, uh, of uh, repetition. Uh, if you think a morning newspaper and the afternoon newspaper might have a huge overlap between the uh, messages and reports covered there. Then autographical spelling and word vision errors in the original text. Uh, LCB has said something about that in relation to web-based material. It's the same uh, with text leaning. Uh, one uh, often find a lot of these things de uh, often depending on the quality of uh, the material scanned. And then she also referred to basic scanning errors. Um, that is simply uh, things like uh, the uh, ish with inverted circumflex of superior scan as an ordinary S, or uh, a simple vowel like A scanned as an E, or a K as an L, C, uh, something like that. All right. Then we try to summarize uh, the text cleaning strategies. The first line of defense, and obviously, if possible, the best solution is manual correction, which simply means reading through the text and correct the mistakes. And in doing that, uh, as I said, which is very time consuming, but you get a good, clean product in the end. This is can often be fruitfully combined with spell checker support, where the spell checker alerts you, flags, points out um, the mistake, and then uh, you can decide whether you want to clean it or not, or change it or whatever. Also very useful, automatic search and replace individual items. Uh, I always immediately add here automatic uh, research on semi-automatic. Automatic, automatic uh, search and replace in cases where uh, you are absolutely sure that this is a consistent scanning error. All issues can be simultaneously or, uh, changed. But I often find myself with the second uh, idea of uh, semi-automatic search and replace which means that you do a search and replace, but you do it under controlled circumstances. You check each item, should it be changed or should it not be changed? Um, and you often find uh, that you cannot just run an automatic search and replace on things which could, where two different things could be all correct in this specific context. Automatic search and replace with basic macros. Uh, getting back to the suggestion I've made that what we do in text cleaning for most of us should be within reach of an ordinary skilled computer user. And this is the type of thing where you build your own macro uh, by com combining a number of things that you typically have to change. And then you could just run the macro uh, for example, a word macro, and which will change all those things simultaneously so that you do not have to do your search and replace on individual items uh, one by one. Detecting and cleaning duplications through concordance lines uh, repetition. We have a, sli a slide, upcoming slide that more or less will show this. Um, and I will say a little bit more about that. And I also want to say a little bit more about anonymizing text containing sensitive information. Okay. If you look at this uh, slide here, you can see by just looking at the concordance lines that uh, it is easy to detect uh, duplications, like you see there in line one and two and four. Uh, and, and, and yeah, um, it seems. But, uh, and then you can immediately see um, as the source 
is also available and given in the program. This is was generated by Wordsmith tools. Uh, and then you can see, okay, this is this source is a specific source that has been duplicated, and you can uh, get rid of and remove the duplication. All right. Um, now we come to the issue of the anonymization of text. Uh, given the necessity of sharing data, as Elsby has mentioned, uh, limitation pose, limitations posed by data concerning sensitive information. And if I may dare to add, especially in the times that we live in now, think of all the popular legislation and all those things, uh, I have, have see quite a sensitivity uh, in this type of things. And sometimes this, uh, the owner of the source tells you that it's fine to use my material and uh, we're willing to sign the con copyright contract as long as you do uh, sufficient anonymization on the text. Uh, now that can be defined as a process of masking or removing sensitive uh, information uh, so that it is no longer personal. Uh, and a good example of a text anonymizer is Ochomato, uh, the tool for the anonymization of text, uh, which entails the identification of entities, uh, uh, which might contain confidential information. I will give you a slide showing a few practical examples right now. Okay, then um, two critical challenges for anonymization tools. The anonymized text must remain readable, meaningful, uh, and useful uh, 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 for simple context-based analysis. Evaluation of performance of an anonymizing tool is challenging. And in our experiments with Ochomato, Ocho for example, uh, we had found some mixed results as far as this is concerned. Let me give you a few basic examples. On the screen, you have uh, three sections, the input section, uh, an output section uh, type one, and an output section type two. I'm going to quickly compare uh, the input and output number two. If you look at the green, the words marked in green, uh, for example, La Morena and Tato, and in the input, you will see in output two that La Morena has been changed to Labone and Tato to uh, Farisa. But uh, you can also immediately see, uh, if you look at the red ones, uh, those are also items that preferably should have been changed uh, by uh, the uh, 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 software and it simply did not pick it up. Especially concerning uh, for our purposes, in this example, uh, in red there is a, a University in Pretoria and the name Elsie Taliart. Um, and uh, those are uh, names and entities that should have been changed, especially in our case, uh, the University of Pretoria. Uh, we don't want that to be missed by the anonymizer. Okay, um, before I do my uh, final slide, I believe, uh, I just want to uh, give Elsie an opportunity uh, and ask her, LCB, is there anything that you would, would like to add to these six slides on text cleaning? Um, no, I don't think so. I think you, um, you've you covered more or less all. Um, but I think maybe what one can add is is um, perhaps the, the challenges with regard to the Automata tool is um, the quality and the extent of the database of named entities. And I think any text anonymizer is, is simply as good 
as the underlying database of named entities. So, uh, the, of course, the, the bigger the database, um, the better the anonymizing tool will be in the end. Um, so I think it's not an inherent flaw. I just think that um, maybe the database needs to be of named entities needs to be extended. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and I'm glad that you mentioned this now because I uh, am working on a suggestion. One of the ways how one could improve it. Um, if you think of spelling checkers, um, the, the concept of the custom dictionary in a spelling checker, uh, a list of words that you uh, compile as time goes on for your specific situation, which then are considered by the spelling checker um, very successfully. And I have the same idea uh, that one should compile such a list to run concurrently with the software for your specific uh, needs, like I've, the examples I've mentioned of Elsa Italia and University uh, of Pretoria. That, in my view, should be in such a custom list. Okay, the final um, remark uh, I want to make, and I want to uh, mention some good suggestions um, given by Uwe, Uwe Kwastov of Leipzig, uh, in this regard, in uh, the sense of uh, linking the cleanness of your corpus with the purpose of what you want to use it for. And we try to make a list um, of the different levels. Okay, ideally speaking, one could one would say that no, if you work with corpora, just take the corpus and clean it 100% before you try any applications. But in real life, it doesn't work like this. Especially in lexicography, uh, the late great Sue Atkins uh, always emphasized that uh, one should not spend 90% of your time cleaning the corpus, compiling and cleaning the corpus. One should see what a uncleaned or a dirty corpus can do for your specific purpose. And for lexicography, for example, um, she was by far in favor of using a dirty corpus uh, rather than lose the time on cleaning the corpus. So what we do here is to give you an idea of the cleanliness of your corpus versus what you can do with it. If you are dealing with frequency lists, and I don't have to, the time to say, uh, although I can say a lot about frequency list and the applications thereof, frequency list, you can work with a dirty corpus. Uh, you might um, lose a few counts in the process, but in the end, you get a reasonable conclusion regarding the frequency of a word. Authentic um, corpus examples, um, that uh, you can also use a, uh, a dirty corpus for. Let's say if, uh, if you're a lexicographer and you just need a few good examples from the corpus, uh, you only need about two or three or five. Um, if the dirty corpus missed number seven, eight or nine, doesn't matter, you still have your examples. Um, concordance lines, same. Uh, you can go a long way with a dirty corpus because uh, you only need a maximum of about 100, 100 uh, uh, corpus lines usually for, you, for your work, referring again to lexicography. Text verification. Uh, now, this uh, I just want to quickly explain in two sentences. That is a program that we are uh, developing uh, for, uh, for users in text production. If they compile a phrase or a sentence, that that phrase or sentence can be immediately compared to a corpus to see uh, if there are exact matches or near matches or part of speech matches uh, in the corpus to confirm the correctness um, of the created piece of text. If you talk about things like markup, part of speech, morphological analysis, limitization, then of course you also require a clean corpus. Rare occurrences of words, uh, a relatively clean corpus, uh, because uh, you might just lose, they might have just one or two or three or five occurrences. And if 
if the corpus is dirty, you might lose them or might lose a lot of them. And then finally, spelling checkers, grammar checkers, and uh, as I've mentioned, the text verification, you need exact, uh, you need 100% clean corpus. Uh, no errors can be there. You don't ever want uh, your spell ch spelling checker to accept an incorrect word or the other way around uh, to flag uh, correctly uh, spelled words. Okay, this is as far as I go. Thank you. Yes, uh, um, yeah. good morning. I'm Michelle Hoesen, and the third driver of this lorry, and I hope I don't crash it. Um, so in addition to the digitization of texts and the harvesting of digital born data, we also digitize audio material and video material. So the hardware used for converting audio material is a USB cassette capture that is taped to MP3 converter, and the software used is Audacity. Now, Audacity is an open source software and is regarded as being as effective as many premium paid for software applications. So although Audacity was re released about 20 years ago, the software is updated regularly with the latest update being in September 2022. So we always make use of the latest software versions of any of the software that we use for text digitization, video digitization, and audio digitization. So before we start with the digitization of audio material, the quality of the audio cassettes must be determined. The quality of the audio cassettes is affected by incorrect storage. For example, the audio cassettes have been stored in places with unregulated temperatures and or they have not been placed in a sealed cassette case. So the quality of the audio cassettes is also affected by deterioration because of age and physical damage to the cassettes itself. Um, we digi digitize the audio cassettes um, for, yeah, we digitize the audio cassettes according to uh, default quality settings. And in this case, it must be um, 44,100 hertz and 32 bit format in stereo. The digitized file format is .aup, and then the final format is stored in waveform audio file format. Format. Now, before we store it in the final format, um, it must be determined that uh, the digitization process uh, um, has been followed correctly um, and that we did it according to the default quality settings and also any static at the beginning or the end of a digitized file must be removed. And this is done by making use of the functions in Audacity. Now, the first challenge posed by the digitization of video material is finding video home systems, that is VHS machines um, and Betamax machines for playing of video and Betamax cassettes. Since this is all technology, these machines with the remotes um, are not readily available. Spare parts such as drive uh, belts are also only available outside of South Africa. So just a side note, the main difference between a video cassette and a Betamax cassette is the size. Betamax cassettes could only record an hour's worth of content, whereas a video cassette allowed one to make a recording um, of up to six hours. So the software used for the digitization process is Algata Video Capture, and it is regarded as one of the best video capture devices. So one must digitize video material according to very specific criteria, um, aspects such as resolution, bit rate, audio, color mode, recording format, and recording video type must be taken into consideration. And the on-screen display messages, the OSD messages, must also be removed and they may not appear in any digitized video um, files. So the digitized version is then stored in .mpg format. 
Now, the pre provision of metadata for any digitized resource is an indispensable part of the digitization process. Um, my apologies, I skipped a slide. Uh, yeah, I skip an skipped another one. Um, OK, so I'll just speak. Um, so Bernard uh, describes metadata as the kind of data that is needed to describe a digital resource in sufficient detail and with sufficient accuracy for some agent to determine whether or not that digital resource um, is of relevance to a particular inquiry. So the metadata for text files should ideally be presented in an integrated form together with a text file using the same encoding principles uh, or markup language used in the text file itself. Now, presenting the metadata in this format facilitates the identification, management, um, and access, use, and preservation of a digital resource. It also helps to ensure that the text and the metadata are kept together and can be distributed as a single unit. Now, the Text Encoding Initiative, the TEI, has a major influence in this regard, publishing an extensive set of guidelines for the encoding of machine readable data. Now, the process and the format uh, and the format published by the TEI requires considerable computational expertise. We opted for a simpler, albeit uh, perhaps old fashioned approach. We provide mostly standard bibliographic descriptions uh, in a separate document um, where we include the title of the document, the, uh, the author's name and the date of the publication, the ISBN, the copyright clearance status, the format of the file, um, also the language, and we use the um, international organization of standardizations language codes and the media type and the encoding and the file format um, or file extension and then the name of the document so each digitized file and that is um, referring to text and audio and video material um, is stored to a specific format we um, use the language code at the beginning and then an underscore, we give the title of a book and then the surname of the public, of the apologies of the author, and then also the genre description. And then um, the same goes for video and audio material where we just um, provide the name of the title and then also the presenter of the uh, video or the video cassette and then the date of publication. Now, um, seeing as we are working with very old and precious resources, the metadata is not always readily available, which poses a challenge. Sometimes it's written on a piece of paper, um, just put in a book, um, or the cassette player, or the cassette tape will just have some scribbling on it. Um, some of the books have been published in, 1940, 1950, and they don't even have the name of the author or an ISBN. Um, so yeah, we are maneuvering around this and also working closely together with the publishers and also consulting the National um, Libraries database for this information. Um, okay, and this is Professor Prince Lewis' slide. Okay, thank you, uh, me again. Um, a few remarks about copyright considerations. Copyright is a salient aspect of text digitization. And one should really not underestimate uh, the need and the urgency of uh, clearing out copyright, which I would like to say a few things about. One could uh, sometimes one uh, one hears people saying something like, "Ah, oh, you know, if something is on the internet, uh, there is no copyright on the internet." This is totally wrong and to and very dangerous um, to say uh, things like this assumption. Um, copyright uh, the, the digitization that we do is in fact a form of republishing, and obtaining copyright clearance. 
and is absolutely essential. Now, often people are very serious about um, copyright considerations and needs and clearance and, and so on. And they desperately start uh, seeking for guidelines or uh, rules that uh, one could use um, for safe use of material. And the first thing that often comes up is the idea of fair use. Yes, there is something like uh, fair use uh, in uh, uh, the use of text and other, other material, but um, there are a few problems with the concept um, itself. Very often, if you, uh, let's say, go on the internet at, at, at a site having images, then they will see they will say something like, okay, these images are copyright free. But the moment you get to the image, it says um, pending copyright permissions. And the only way that you can do it is to apply for copyright. So you're more or less back to, um, to square, square one. And um, I've attended a full day conference once with, uh, 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 presented by a legal expert on copyright. And at the end of the day, I was still quite unsure about what can be assumed and what can be taken for, gra taken for granted and what, what, what not. Sometimes people say, no, it's about percentage. Uh, you're safe if you uh, do not uh, copy and use more than 10% of a source. That is not so. A single page, if it's the crucial page uh, in a text, uh, can land you into copyright trouble. So I came to the conclusion that I might be wrong, I very often am, but I see no safe generic copyright rules um, for text scanning. And the only thing that we revert to or regard as safe is obtain the explicit permission of the copyright owner. Very often, uh, copyright holders are prepared um, to grant copyright. To give you an example, a publisher might not want you to use its material, but are willing to make an exception if you can uh, make substantial changes uh, to the text, uh, uh, which make it quite different from, from the original, uh, like uh, the phrase uh, sentence scrambling, for example. So all these are possibilities that you could suggest to the copyright owner. Uh, but my strong recommendation is always obtain explicit permission to the copyright owner. OK, I'm going to ask LCB uh, to add to the copyright issue, because we have uh, been together in this dilemma for many years now, and also to do the conclusion for us. Uh, thank you, Donnie. I think we are slowly running out of time, so I'm not going to add anything to the copyright issue. Uh, I'm going to go directly to the conclusion. Um, I think, first of all, the point has been made, I hope, clearly in this um, presentation that digitization entails much more than simple scanning. People think that if you digitize, you simply chase a piece of paper through a scanner machine, through a scanner, and then you have digitized whatever content is on that page. So as you can see, if you want to do it properly, um, there are certain ways and processes and procedures and protocols um, that have to be followed in order to make the data um, available for downstream processing. Um, also related to further use of data um, is the importance of storing the data in the correct format. Um, it doesn't help if you do not stay, uh, store the data in, in a format which is, which is not accessible. And um, also, of course, um, having the metadata available. Um, uh, with regard to preservation of material and quality compromised exceptions, one uh, often comes across material um, that is extremely valuable. Uh, it may be some kind of a 
a, a cultural artifact, artifactual text, um, which uh, of, of which the, the quality of the original is not very good. Then one has to try and say, well, digitization also has an, um, as an add on value, um, the function of preservation. And although this is not the primary um, aim of the UP digitization mode, we do understand the importance of preserving material which is extremely valuable. So um, that is also a kind of an offshoot of what we do at the UP digitization node. Um, and then I think the last slide is just to acknowledge the, um, uh, the support um, that we receive from uh, SADILA, the South African Center for Digital Language Resources, of course, for which we are extremely grateful. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you very much, um, LCB, Dani, and um, uh, Michelle. Sorry, I was reading some notes <laughs> at the same time. Uh, thank you very much. I think we had a really nice ride um, with three lorry drivers. I see Michelle actually had a proper driver's seat. I think that's why she was sharing the slides as well. Um, I see there is one question. I, I also have a few comments, but let's tackle that first question in the chat. Uh, can African languages be used for automated writing as it's done with AI tools? I'm not sure if you have any comments or... Um, I would, if I can come in here, Meno, um, of course it would be, it would be wonderful if it, if it, if we could have that. But at the moment, the answer is no. But um, I mean, uh, we as the uh, UP digitization mode can always, you know, um, sell the data to the guys from ChatGPT, and then we can retire in <laughs> in luxury. <laughs> um, so um, no, at the moment, of course not, um, because we do not have the resources which are needed to design these kind of systems. Systems. Yeah, thanks. If I can add to that, uh, in in principle, um, yes, of course, but I think there is a longer way um, for us to go to uh, or to reach that ob objective compared to other languages of the world. In this regard, I think uh, C text, for example. Um, is making quite significant progress in doing many of the underlying things like morphological analysis, part of speech tagging, and um, uh, all those enabling um, uh, things uh, needed for something like that. But I agree with LCB that it's still a long way to go. Thanks, uh, Dani. Uh, I quickly like to add something there as well. So I think you're, you're fully right, but now I think you're also underselling yourself. So the main, uh, um, kind of source that, that you need to have is a lot of text. So that's why it can be created for English, for example, and some other languages that have huge amounts of text. So if you don't have digital text available, then you can't do it. I mean, you can create these tools like CText are doing, but we really need to have a lot of example text um, from the languages to be able to, to build something like this. Yes, agreed. Uh, okay, I see a few thank yous. Um, well, thank you indeed. Um, so I have a few small comments. Um, so first of all, what, what I really like, uh, you actually just mentioned CText. I really like that you, uh, you've you used CText or you've analyzed CText or evaluated CText tools, for example. Um, so I think that's a nice example to see that, you know, the work that's being done in South Africa is actually useful. This is something specifically for the South African languages. Um, so this work is done, and this is actually growing the accessibility of the language. I think that's 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 really nice. Um, my my other comment, and I'm uh, while others are pe perhaps uh, typing in questions in the chat. Um, so you mentioned several times that you're constrained by by well, a lot of different things, um, and one of them is expertise. And I think that is something that might be relatively easy to tackle. I mean, it's you can't magically create um, huge amounts of money or new um, VHS um, uh, machines, um, but perhaps we can tackle this this um, expertise constraint. So how can we, and especially now we have a few people here uh, in the meeting as well, how can we 
kind of train others to help with the dig digitization of these language resources. Um, so for example, training related to metadata, or if you don't have the actual machines, you can't do the scanning, but perhaps you can do um, some, some, some cleanup. So how can we, how can we tackle this problem? Um, I think if, if, if I can come in here, um, we do have a training component in the work that we do in that um, we make use of, of, of student assistants who are trained. Um, but you know, students are kind of fleeting. You have them one year and then they go on the next and um, they take the skills that they've learned with them. So next year you start with a new bunch of students. So we do um, do some skills training, but as I say, it is not something that is really sustainable. Um, but yeah, we the, that is how we we try and 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 do the uh, address the issue of of skill shortage. Mm. Okay, thank you. So I was actually wondering as well because you you raised a lot of problems that are not really solved yet, right? I mean, and and it's a very difficult task. So something like um, possibilities for student projects. So I don't know exactly how the educational system works in, in South Africa, um, but I, in the Netherlands, when I was still living in the Netherlands, I supervised a lot of master students where you can actually get a lot of the kind of small problems and it's it's safe because it doesn't directly influence the work you're doing, but they might actually come up with very interesting solutions to um, say specific data cleanup uh, for African languages. I'm not sure if that's of if, if you do that as well, or if so, if people here might be interested, where where would they need to go? Where would they start? You know, I can't really answer that question. You're talking about constraints, and you're talking about the educational system, um, and one put one can put that in the same sentence: <laughs> the educational system. <laughs> <laughs> is one of the constraints, you know, um, administratively speaking, to integrate what we're doing into some academic program is, uh, it's it's uh, so much administrative red tape. Um, what would be, I think, more useful, more feasible is to rather collaborate with other entities that do have um, these skills. Um, for example, at UP, we have this... Um, chair in data sciences and they do very sophisticated work and I think it would be uh, a better option to rather collaborate with them because they obviously have the skills so it's just a question of of collaboration and setting up these channels of collaboration I think if I can quickly add to that I would also uh, like to add the idea of planning uh, and, and I think we can do at this stage with uh, uh, a, a brainstorming effort or a, a session uh, planning the road ahead. Um, so, so far, I think most of our time uh, has been taken up by the daunting task that we are busy with. So I think it, it might be a good idea if we can uh, to put it in simple terms, um, uh, uh, interested parties come together and try to work out something. That sounds that sounds wonderful. I think that's a good idea. Perhaps that's also. Uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure if, if if I can make that request, but for the people who are here to kind of think about um, how we can set something like this up, or how we can start these kind of collaborations. Uh, I'm I'm not sure if other people still have questions or comments, requests. I don't see anything in the chat at this moment. Uh, Sisanda? Uh, thank you very much. And thank you so much to the presenters for the interesting presentation and the great work that you're doing. I would like to find out um, with all of the work that's been happening at the center, are your resources that you have maybe already worked on publicly available for people who are wanting to research the content? So I know obviously the presentation today was about the process. But um, with, with everything that has gone into uh, creating these uh, digitized resources, are they at all available in an open access uh, platform and format that other people can access? 
Uh, if I can answer that, um, yes, some of the work that, that some of the material that we have um, processed is available on the Sadilar uh, um, resources platform. Um, some of the textual data and so on is available. Um, we have one problem, we're struggling to get copyright. Um, so we cannot release the data before the copyright clearance hasn't been done. So as the copyright clearance comes in, more and more data is made available on these um, platforms. So yes, there are already some of these resources are available, but not all of them. As I say, we're still working on the on the copyright issue. Yes, and if I can underline that, uh, I think the way uh, to go is uh, is is Sadilar. Um, what 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 whatever uh, we produce uh, and copy get copyright cleared uh, will in the end be available. I think that is the route uh, uh, to work through uh, uh, what is available on the Sadilar website. Uh, we are not in a position uh, really at the moment uh, to fulfill that need. Thank you. I pasted. Sorry, I pasted in the could chat I, the I link to the place where you can find this. Thank you. I also just wanted to then make a sort of follow up comment um, because the work that I'm doing is on uh, the early South African black press newspapers from the 1800s and early 1900s. And what I'm discovering is that there are a lot of people who are perhaps working on the same texts that I'm working on. And, you know, that issue of duplicating all of this effort, I think, you know, the protocol that you've come up with, for example, would have saved me so much um, work if I had known about it. But I wonder if as, as people are working on digitized texts, um, we could think of a way to create communities so that we are not duplicating all of the difficult work that goes into creating these and instead working collaboratively and, and, and sort of um, adding on to what people have, have already done. Thank you so much. I think that is actually the whole purpose of these um, study lab repository. Um, as far as I understand it, anybody that generates any kind of data um, is free to contact Sadilar and to ask them to put it on their, on their open resource repository. Um, and, and there are um, many options of licensing available. You know, you can, you can decide what, uh, what can and cannot be done with your data. Um, but also I think a kind of a community would be a wonderful idea. No, I, I fully support that. Um, so if you have data available that you want to share, you can um, take a look at the repository. If uh, I know the process might be a little bit uh, daunting to uh, to start with, um, if you need help, you can just reach out to to us, to Sadler or to me, um, and we'll guide you through this or we'll discuss the possibilities. Um, and I, I fully support the idea of kind of building this, um, this community. So that's also what we're trying to do within the Escalator uh, project, to bring people together with either research questions or a particular skills that they can that they can bring and actually start working together. Uh, Marissa, you typed in a whole um, a whole text. Should I read it aloud or do you want to um, add to this? <laughs> Marissa? Okay, let me just read it then. So Marissa says, we've also played around with the idea of creating a database of expertise, a simple contact list of all the H stakeholders have access to, um, to uh, that list and the very specific projects and skills that have been created by the various training opportunities in the project funded by Sadler, for instance, having such a shared database, an SADH LinkedIn of sorts, might help us build on already um, established skills or see where we're lacking in practical experience and target those skills in future training. Uh, I now see that her connection is really bad. Um, we actually started with this as well within the uh, Escalator project called the Stakeholder Map. Um, let me quickly find that link. Um, so you can... Um, you can put your information on there with, and, or you can search for um, people and projects, et cetera, um, happening inside South Africa. So this is the link. Um, 
And of course, this can only be a success if people actually put in their information. So we're still trying to find people who are willing to, to put in their names, their expertise, perhaps projects that they were running. And if we can actually kind of collaboratively find all that information, then we can, um, uh, we'll, we'll make it easier to collaborate, I think, or find each other. So I hope that's useful as well. I'm not sure if there are any more questions or comments. We are running a little bit over time. People are also leaving for next meetings. Okay, I don't see any questions or hands. Then I'd really like to thank you um, again, LCB, Dani and Michelle for a nice presentation. Um, I will make this recording available on the DH Colloquium website. Um, so people can also revisit uh, the presentation. Uh, and I think if people are interested in collaboration, uh, uh, can I say that they're, they can contact you as well, see if we can get some more digitization happening. Um, yeah, I guess from our side, thank you for the opportunity and thank you to everybody who attended. Thank you very much. Thank you very much from my side. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for taking the time to give this presentation. And I'll stop the recording.